So welcome to the April 21st Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee call. Uh, as you are all aware, two things we must abide by. The first one is the antitrust policy notice that is currently displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct. So for our agenda today, we have our standard announcements. Um, the Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. If you'd like to have something added to that newsletter, please leave a comment on the wiki page that is linked in our agenda. And the second announcement is the Hyperledger Global Forum is uh, still accepting CFPs um, for just over a week more. And I did see yesterday, I think it was yesterday, an announcement come out that there are also an extra day of workshops that are um, open. And so if you'd like to submit a CFP for a workshop, uh, I believe those are now available on the CFP site as well. Uh, and then Hart is the call for program committee volunteers still open? Sorry, clicking the unmute button. Uh, yes, we are looking for a couple more volunteers. So particularly if anyone on the TSC is interested in joining, uh, several people already have, uh, please feel free to reach out. All right, thanks Hart. Any other announcements that anybody has to make today? All right, seeing no hands, seeing nobody coming off mute, I will take that as a no. Uh, so we've got the quarterly reports. I did see the uh, Hyperledger Fabric report come in um, either last night or this morning, don't know which, um, but it was in my inbox this morning. So uh, Dave, thank you for that. Um, I've seen a few people have already had a chance to look at it, but um, we'll make sure that's kept on the agenda for next week for everybody to have the opportunity to review the, the Fabric report. Um, next week is the Hyperledger Sawtooth report that's due. And of course, we always have the calendar out there for people to take a look at. Um, so with that, I do have one item that I'd like to discuss from the TS T TSC business this week um, around the TSC responsibilities, the issue that um, we reviewed last week in our TSC meeting, and I believe we've got about six or seven sort of check marks already in the um, in the issue itself as far as approvals. I did see one change, Dave, I think that you suggested um, that came in there um, just to add an extra S to one of the words, but I think that's the only specific change that I've seen uh, requested. Uh, I was thinking maybe we could have a vote on this to see if uh, we would like to uh, formally approve this in a TSC meeting. Um, but if anybody has any sort of uh, discussion here that we should have before that, or we don't think we're ready yet, uh, now is the time to speak up. I guess there is one more item to be added, point number nine, and that's not added yet in one of the comments I saw there. Oh, I think you just added the, the above one. Uh, so do we want to add implicitly the subscribing to the TSC mailer list? Yeah, I'm happy to do put that in with the uh, with the S missing that uh, Dave uh, spotted. It, it, as I pointed out, it's, it it has to be in the second list, so it wouldn't be number nine because that's the charters list. But uh, that's a detail. Yeah, makes sense, sir. Okay, any other comments or concerns? So I guess I just thought of one um, mm -hmm. in, along the same lines. Uh, what about joining the GitHub org? Is that a requirement? I guess, if they, I guess if they want to be informed of the 
uh, issues that are coming up on the TSC hyperledger slash TSC repo, um, then that would probably be a requirement as well. Okay, um, there are a couple that aren't, but it's we can address that later, I think. Okay. Yeah, I mean, as I said before, I mean, we can always expand on it and iterate. It's not the end of the world. That's right. Yeah, if we come up with other things that we want to add to this after the fact. And I suspect uh, these kind of small things are not controversial by any means. It's just like, you know, so we can just casually uh, agree through uh, pull requests and on small additions. Completely agree, Arno. Okay, any other uh, questions or comments? Any objections to us voting, I guess, that would be um, where we're at at this point. So to be clear, I mean, we're talking about approving this pull request uh, with the two additional changes, which is adding this requirement about being on the TSC mailing list and the uh, GitHub org, and yep. fix and adding the missing S. And adding the missing S, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny after all, uh, you know, so many people looking at it, it's like we still miss it, and it's like, oh, wait. <laughs> but it's good. It's Glad I could add some power. power. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> So I'm happy to approve this, of course. All right, so shall we take that as a motion, Arno? Yes. Do we have I a second? So. Second. All right, thanks, Nathan. Um, yeah, Ryan, do you wanna lead us to a vote? It doesn't have to be a roll call vote, but just a... Yeah, uh, all those who wish to abstain, uh, say abstain or some. <laughs> uh all those in uh who wish for the motion not to pass please say nay and uh all in favor say aye aye captain aye aye, 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 aye captain aye, aye. <laughs> uh, motion passes thank you all right thanks Ray. And thanks, Arno, for putting that together for us and for all of the input that we had from the TSC on that particular issue. So as far as I know, we don't have any, any additional um, TSC business this week, but before we get to the task force discussion, um, is there any TSC business that we should be talking about that I did not um, know about or did not include in our agenda? I uh, I did put this issue on, and then uh, Dano uh, filed a pull request. I would just like the TSC to, you know, read this over and uh, add comments on uh, Dano's pull request. We don't have to discuss it in this meeting. Okay. Well, thanks for that. I will uh, have to uh, review. What was that pull request thirty three? I think it was um yeah 33. all right so yeah pull request 33 on the thc repo we'll make sure we include that on the discussion items for next week um but feel free to have a look at that before we get to next week any other uh thc business that anybody would like to bring up at this point All right, seeing so nobody coming off mute or raising their hands, I will take that as a no. Um, so Jim, I guess it is up to you to walk us through the task force discussion for project health dashboards. Sounds good. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, let me start sharing. Let's see. Okay, um, so I created uh, the task force page and uh, there will be a page for today's minutes, uh, but I guess just as a refresher uh, for everyone uh, for the background of this, uh, this thread, um, 
uh, we were talking about uh, project reports uh, in early in January, and there was a follow-up action to to uh, think about uh, what kind of data can we pull, pull together uh, to generate some sort of um, uh, report uh, for every project uh, whenever the TSC needs to make decisions on the health status of a project. This could be a status change on the project from incubation to active or uh, vice, uh, vice versa. Um, or for labs to, to go into incubation. Um, we just feel like uh, if we have the right types of data, then a lot of decisions can be made uh, uh, much easier and faster. Um, so uh, there's already uh, pretty good sources of uh, such data, uh, such as the Insight um, by Linux Foundation. Uh, and there's also previous uh, efforts, uh, in particular made by Tracy and others, uh, to generate uh, reports based on GitHub uh, uh, data. Um, so this effort is to uh, kind of pull together all the, uh, all the thinking uh, and uh, get this, um, get this, um, take it to the uh, to the uh, finish line basically uh, so we can have these be hosted somewhere or maybe uh, there's something that can be embedded in every report uh, just by default uh, so every every report will have this uh, be automatically generated uh, from all the data sources so that's the that's the thinking behind this effort uh, and um, there is a running uh, issue in GitHub that has got contributions from many people. Uh, thanks for uh, everybody who's participated. And, and the result of the discussion we've got so far um, is captured here um, uh, on this page. Um, but uh, I want to uh, start with the high level goals uh, so we can talk about it and agree. And then we can get into um, um, the details. So I think the high level goals as, as displayed here is to gather and present rich set of data uh, about a project uh, can be both top level projects and labs uh, and enable data driven decision making at TSC. Uh, specific tasks uh, to be completed. Uh, number one, we need to define the types of data that make sense. Uh, this has been what uh, uh, the participants on this effort have been uh, focusing on. Uh, what are the types of data that would help with the decision making? Is it on code? Is it on uh, person? Is it on activity? Uh, that sort of thing. And then we should decide how to collect that kind of thing. Uh, given the, the data we believe are useful, where to find it, how to collect them. Uh, and based on the, the, the discussions we've got so far, some of them uh, will be available programmatically, uh, but others we may have to re uh, resort to uh, manual um, contribution, manual collection. Um, for the list of deliverables uh, for this uh, task force, uh, I think we should uh, document the decisions um, in the GitHub issue, or maybe there's other uh, better uh, format uh, to document uh, what we decided on. Um, and we should discuss with the Linux Foundation Insight uh, IT team about enhancing the, the dashboard and uh, the gathering of the data and generating reports. Uh, such capabilities are missing today. There's a lot in there, but uh, some key capabilities are still missing. Uh, and for the, if we have uh, data that has to be collected manually, then we need to publish some sort of uh, recommended practices uh, so the community can make the information available uh, and we can collect them. Um, 
I like to think we could accomplish everything in three months uh, if that's not uh, if that turns out to be too optimistic, uh, probably uh, six months uh, at most, uh, and we should uh, time box it. So um, let's uh, let's let's look at what we've got so far. So this is just capturing uh, the input from the previous discussions in the uh, in the in the issue. Uh, so I can go through these items, and uh, but everybody, please feel free to jump in on any of these points, and we can discuss more. So uh, let me put this in edit mode. Okay. So the first one, uh, first category um, is community. Uh, I think that's that's no brainer that um, it's a key success uh, to the to any projects is a diverse uh, active community that cares about the code base. Um, so we've got five uh, subcategories under, underneath it. Growth um, is the community growing. Diversity uh, is it looked after by a single organization, uh, or uh, does it have a diverse uh, source of contributions, which tend to make the project more viable uh, in the long run? Um, retention is um, for contributors. Uh, do they feel their input are are being respected, uh, being valued, and their code contributions? are getting to the main uh, branch and getting to customers' hands. So they're delivering value. Um, I'll skip maturity uh, to the end because I was having trouble um, uh, articulate, articulating this. So maybe uh, someone else can help with this one. Uh, responsiveness is kind of... Uh, um, tied to a lot of the others is how responsive is the current uh, contributor group are to, uh, to potential contributors. Maybe they reached out on Discord or through a PR. Uh, are, they, are they given uh, attentions? Are due diligence being uh, given to their, to their contributions? So um, maturity, I, I feel like this came from David. Uh, I don't know if David is on. Yeah, or I'm someone here. Someone else can uh, uh, speak to this. Yeah, go ahead, David. So basically, I, my thought on maturity was it gives context to the other stats there. So for example, if you're a brand new project who've only been around for a month or two, your stats are very likely going to look different from somebody who's perhaps you know been around for a project that's been around for several years and has a different. The community is going to look different, right? I mean, I think, for example, that new project probably won't have the same sort of organizational diversity. So it helps give context, right? I think something that might be a red flag for a more mature project, for example, if you if you didn't have organizational diversity after three years, for example, that might be a red flag. Whereas if you don't have organizational diversity and you just started, that's not a flag, right? I mean, it's natural for a new project that just came from one organization, for example, to not have that diversity yet. So I think it's just a way to, to help set context for those other projects. And I meant diversity here or maturity here in the sense of uh, you could measure it simply by age, for example, or the stage, you know, an incubated project is gonna be less mature in this sense than a graduated project. So that, that's all I, I meant by that. Okay, gotcha. That makes sense. So I, I guess uh, this hey, means Jim. maturity is more of, a, more of a qualifier rather than a category by itself. Well, Jim, I would, I would add uh, specifically maybe a couple of bullets there. One around when was the first code commit? And then maybe another around frequency of releases. Yeah. Okay. Because I think a more mature project is well, I think when you're when you're 
like if you look at fabric right i think they have quarterly releases that's a pretty mature project they're able to you know get to a place where they can plan for releases every three months and successfully do that um versus you know maybe a newer project hasn't quite figured out when they should do releases or how often or how they manage that whole process so i, I think you know that's the the sort of thing that i think about when i say frequency of releases mm -hmm. okay gotcha are, are they are they able to uh stick to the published uh release schedule that reflects the maturity mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely makes sense when you are working on still working on like core foundation of the architecture you could easily step into unforeseen complexities and and previously published schedule will be blown out of the water versus if it's a mature code base and it's just adding enhancements then it's much easier to to stick to the schedule yeah that makes sense any other comments on on these aspects on the community itself uh, are we missing any important aspects as far as the the health indicators of the community itself okay yeah um we can always revisit this uh, later so i'll i'll continue um for the code aspect um that's obviously another important um dimension uh for project um is the code itself and so far we've got two categories um one we call usefulness um which is um, how are um, the general community reacting to this project's uh, functionality? Uh, it can be really cool, can have a lot of coding there, but if people are not using it, it's indicated that um, it's either way ahead of its time or uh, maybe there's a better solution somewhere else. So um, usefulness is, um, are, is this the right solution for the right uh, problem? Um, is, the, is the problem that's being addressed a, a real problem? How many people are struggling with it? So that's, that's, the, that's the usefulness aspect. Uh, notice that we didn't really capture um, some sort of um, 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 popular uh, aspect for code. Um, how many lines of code is in the project? Uh, how active is the code being pushed? Um, I don't think it's uh, a necessary good indicator to the health uh, status of a project because you can be working on something you know just among a few people uh, that pushes ton of code and you know there are 10 PRs every day but if if you are the ones who only you are the only ones who are care, who care about this code base for a long time that's indicator that uh, this is not very useful to the general general community Okay, Jim, I, on that point, I do think the commit rate is important and how it changes over time for a project. I don't think that's captured anywhere here. Commit rate. Um, how many uh, lines of code are being pushed in? Or number of commits per month or something like that. Uh, and then you can look at that over time. Like in the fabric reports, I always put a, a commit for the quarter number and then I compare it to the previous year so we can kind of get a feel for is it less active or more active gotcha 
I guess that's um, it feels like a different dimension because um, you know fabric the usefulness uh, is is out of the question. So that's that being established first. I think things like commit rates is a useful indicator, right? Yeah, I agree. It's probably not under the usefulness category, but I think somewhere we should capture it. Yeah, uh, we need something placeholder. Yeah, think of something to call this. Um, it could be like base metrics or something because it's kind of a fundamental metric. Yeah. Well, and maybe to say something more about that, we're tr the production readiness and the usefulness is really trying to measure the growth at the, of the project. This metric seems to be monitoring for when a project might cool down or when a, a project might be starting to become less interesting for whatever reason. So there's probably a few other statistics we could put in here that would help us understand if maybe people are moving off onto other ideas or off onto other projects. Good point. And Jim Hart has his hand up. I don't know if you're able to, while you're talking. Uh, sorry, yeah, I wasn't able to. Okay, I'll, I'll make sure to keep track of okay. that and I'll call. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, Hart, go ahead. Uh, hey, Jim, so um, I like this. Uh, one thing that I don't see mentioned here that I think is important and I don't know where we wanna put it is documentation. Yep. Um, so I don't know whether that goes under code community or what, uh, but I think it's an important thing uh, and, and we should have some, it should be included in this uh, document. Definitely agree. How many people can uh, get their hands on uh, how easy or difficult it is. That's uh, um, it's pretty critical, uh, I guess. This would be more of a uh, manual or subjective uh, measurement, right? The, the quality of the docs. I guess we're mainly uh, referring to the quality of the docs, right, Hart? Well, sure, but just the existence of documentation too on various different things, right? Um, okay. So yeah, both. Um, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And Bobby has her hand up as well. Yeah, Go Jim, ahead, I'd like to I'd like to help you out with that piece because we're working. Uh, we have a task force in the learning materials uh, development working group right now to create some kind of badging that will fit into the existing um, structure. So we'll talk um, later. Um, but I would like to be a part of that piece because our task force will be reporting on that shortly. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Um, so we can talk in more details how to sort of uh, wrap these aspects into a into a badging uh, criteria and have it be uh, captured in a more concise uh, manner. That's great. So we haven't talked about uh, this this part. Um, uh, I believe this was brought up by Hart during the discussion. Um, production readiness. Um, it's kind of related to the usefulness, which would naturally lead to this being used in uh, production and the team working on making it production ready. Um, so um, obvious indicators include, has it been a 1.0 release? Uh, what's the test coverage? Performance and re reliability tests? Um, oh, and I guess documentation is somewhat uh, captured here. Um, yeah, so this would apply more to the top level uh, projects, but even for labs, uh, a, a good documentation would be a, a pretty big uh, factor to be con considered uh, when this lab is brought or, uh, brought up for uh, for a proposal uh, to become incubation. 
Okay, so I guess overall, uh, do we feel pretty good about the aspects on the code aspect? Anything else we should consider? So, Jim, I don't, I don't know what is the, the, the best category to put this in, but uh, you probably might consider something that is related or to, uh, reflects the innovation around the project. So, for example, uh, the amount of uh, uh, you know resource citations or resource publication that is uh, around the area. You know, the technology that the project has been developing uh, is producing. I see. So, so it's, not, saying... it's not. It's not. It's not directly the code, but it's uh, you know, we are working in in a, in a blockchain area that is kind of you know everything is in a distributed system, cryptography, consensus, uh, and server, and you know, it's, it's supposed to be a, a quite a lot of research work around this uh, effort. Uh, so I think that the, 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 this indicator might reflect the innovation around the the, the project and the, the direction that the project is heading towards. Mm -hmm. So do you think it makes sense it falls under usefulness? Uh, maybe this is more a research effort. So even though it's not being picked up by regular users, but it generates uh, research publications and it's being um, cited uh, in, in other people's work. Feels like this belongs under uh, usefulness. So uh, it, it it might reflect usefulness, but I, I think that uh, you know it might it might uh, worth to basically devote com a completely separate se section that you know stands for innovation, because you know a healthy project, uh, in my opinion, has to innovate once in a while, and you know if you will be able to capture the the level of innovation that brought up by the project, it might be you know it might be good. Gotcha. And um, Eric has his hand up as well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think this is a good topic. Uh, we can measure it, you know, reasonably well by looking at like ePrint or Archive or all of the other like uh, research publication websites. Um, this it measures, you know, academic interest in something, and it will let us know sort of like you know what people who are interested in the most cutting edge technology are, you know, are, are following, right? Um, so, you know, this, this is definitely something, um, it's something I have sort of done myself, actually, about a bunch of these projects. Um, and I think it's a good metric uh, to measure, as Artem put it, sort of how cutting edge something is. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. And I'm referring to the ARXIV. Yeah, that's what I was trying to spell. No worries. <laughs> I only managed the three letters of that. <laughs> Nathan has his hand up as well. Yeah, go ahead. Um, a, a classic um, quote is you, you manage what you measure. Um, and so I, I like how we've kind of separated some categories here of uh, the different numbers and what we think that they're useful for. Because one of the dangers here is if we put the wrong numbers in front of the wrong audiences, they'll try to optimize for things that might not be healthy. Um, for example, it would be, uh, it would probably be a bad thing if a project tried to maximize their ePrint ARXIV numbers by themselves, or, or if they tried to increase a number at the expense of the stability of their community. So I, I wonder if once we finish kind of this, all of the things we might want to look at, if it would be good for us to split this kind of dashboard of statistics into more than one category, because some of these things are things we would want to put in front of maintainers and say, you should watch these, but some of them are not because they could lead to optimizing the wrong things for sustainability. 
that makes sense. You're saying if a project is not really uh, driven for innovation, uh, it, it, they shouldn't be staring at the stare board, uh, the dashboard where this category is always zero. Well, or likewise, a lot of early stage project might really need to worry about how many people are contributing and how often are they contributing. But a stable project might need to say, we need to get people to bundle their commits better because the, the thing we need to optimize for is maintainer burden as opposed to onboarding more, more people. So like, it, it feels like we, we need to give some thought to the life cycle of the project and which statistics are most important when, uh, because if we can help the maintainers focus on the right things, it'll make their job a lot easier. If we make them focus on everything, it'll make their job a lot harder. Yeah. Do you think this uh, captured your, your concern here? Sure. Okay, cool, appreciate that. I, I will point out that this document is in edit mode. So like other TSC members should feel free to jump in. Yep, definitely. Thanks Ryan for that uh, reminder. Okay, let me go ahead and update. Cool. I just meant in terms of, you know, we do, we, multiple people can edit at the same time. Yeah. So if other people wanted to jump in here and help edit. So um, I guess for today's call, I'd like to focus on uh, making sure these dimensions are as complete as we can manage. Uh, and then we can, we can use follow-up calls to talk about uh, detailed measures to uh, collect them. Um, so I guess on both categories, are there any other things we should consider or is there a complete new categories we're, we're missing here? Um, there's a couple of early pipeline interest things that sometimes are worth looking at and sometimes are not, like how many stars or forks there are on the repositories, how many people have signed up for the mailing list, or how many, um, how many users are inside of the, the chat channels, where it may not indicate act, actual activity, but it might indicate that um, there are folks we have the opportunity to invite to create that activity. So um, trying to capture um, what, what this means in terms of the data that can be, so you're saying there could be a different dashboard that uh, is presented to early, early state uh, projects? Um, well, I, when I said that, I said it a lot like, if you remember the statistics page that, Rai showed us before it talked about kind of new contributors versus mature contributors versus inactive contributors. There's mm -hmm. this kind of people who are poking around expressing interest, um, kind of part of the, the, the contributor pipeline of people who just are, they're signing up for the mailing list and they're lurking or they've started the repository because they want to watch to see what might be happening next. Um, if we think of the maintainers as kind of managing a, a, a pipeline of new contributors that they have the potential to onboard, seeing a lot of activity at this stage of the pipeline might mean it's time to invite people to, to do something or go, go into your ticket repository and label a bunch of things as good first bugs. Um, if you see a bunch of people kind of wandering by and starting to stop and, and stare, it's a chance to um, invite them to, to join. Yeah, um, so that, that's more of um, um, not measuring the health, but helping the, helping the, providing the data to the maintainers so they can, they can uh, better grow the community. So this is not so much helping the uh, TSCs to judge, it's more to help the maintainers to, to grow. 
Yeah, and I, I think yeah, and for me, that's ultimately that's what the TSC is trying to do in measuring as well, isn't it? I I guess yeah, I guess that's correct. Okay, so. Okay. And Jim, I added up on the maturity um, section. I don't know if this is the right place for it or if it's a good uh, measure of maturity, but the number of good first issues, Nathan, when you said that, that popped into my head as something that maybe um, we would want to be able to look at as well. Yeah. So we're saying, um, a mature project should have more of these or the other way around? I think that a mature project should have them um, because it indicates that they're willing to work with others. And, and I don't know, maybe it goes under a different, uh, maybe it's not maturity, maybe it's something else, but I just feel like it says something about the community if they're willing to bring on new contributors and mentor those contributors through those good first issues. Gotcha. So this is kind of a, is the community, is the project friendly to new contributors? Yeah, that's probably a, a good way of looking at that. So maybe it's a completely different sort of metric um, under community. Gotcha. And Hart has his hand up as well. Yeah, I was just going to suggest exactly your last point there, Tracy. I think this is really important. Uh, and I think we could have a, a whole category on uh, ease of new contributions or sort of new person onboarding, right? Uh, we would like projects to have sort of smooth ways for new people to get involved. Um, so, you know, good first issues is, is just one of these things, right? Um, there are a lot of other different things that some projects do to help new contributors. Um, so yeah, I think this is worth the whole category. Or do you think this captures that category? Sure, yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. That's, that's great. I was just going to challenge whether that's a different category than responsiveness. I think how how this is a how you respond to new contributors is is an important metric of responsiveness. And I think one of the things that we often see and why and one of the why of how we measure time to resolve PRs and time to respond to questions is to make sure that there's not kind of a a hidden decision making cabal. Um, inside of the project where some folks get their issues responded to quickly and other folks get their issues perpetually ignored because um, that's a good sign that the project is having internal conflict or is likely to fork or, or or have other troubles and i think these friendliness numbers kind of all fit into that kind of a category of is everyone committed to working together and responding to one another or tracy what do you think Uh, well, you know, response of how we've, uh, you know, I'm the way we've re defined responsiveness right now is is more about like uh, time to communication. You know, if we want to make a more general definition of like community responsiveness, uh, that's fine. Um, you know, I thought it, I thought responsiveness had meant something more specific, but if we want it to be something broader, that's fine too. Um, you know, however we classify these things or uh, incorporate them into categories, you know, it, it's it's not as important as it sort of just all being mentioned. So I'm, I'm really fine with however we want to present this. 
How about this? I, I think maybe there's an uh, the aspect you guys are trying to capture, uh, Tracy Hart, is how easy it is for someone to self to get self started, to to sort of know this is something they can they can get their hands on before even talking to people. This is sort of their first impression kind of thing. Uh, whereas uh, responsiveness is more once a contributor has done something uh, after have having you know evaluated this, then uh, how are they being treated by the by the maintainer group? Because if you didn't have a good list of the, these things, it would be pretty difficult for a contributor to to get started, right? And then responsiveness wouldn't be reflected at all because there's no communication. I, I think they go hand in hand. Um, I, I think that, you know, if somebody's starting a, a first issue, they're probably gonna be asking a lot of questions and then they're, um, time to get a response on say discord is going to impact whether or not they continue working in that issue or not right was that first impression that they got of the community something that was a good first impression or it really just turned them off completely and they decided they'd go spend their time where they you know felt more welcomed into the community and sorry Arun I uh, started speaking before I noticed you had your hand up no worries, Tracy. So I assume like I can speak now. Yep. Um, I think since we are on this topic, right, one of the hard things right now for us to measure or even know something's happening or there is when we know their contributors and they understand the code base and they would like to proceed with the contributions. However, they are not aligned to the project's roadmap or what project maintainers currently think of, right? So there is definitely conflict of interest among those contributors and how would they like to answer them or where would they like to take it up from there? So I have heard such concerns earlier in a couple of projects, but I don't know. I, I think that's a bigger can of worms if we were to discuss that topic. And yeah, I don't have answers as to how to measure or how, to, how can we even make, understand that something like this exists internally to those projects. So uh, just to uh, make sure I understand, Arun, uh, you are saying, uh, do we want to detect the situation where there are conflicting priorities within the maintainer group of a project? Right. This is to prevent. Group? This is to prevent either of them from stopping to contribute, or even to prevent them from creating a new fork of of the project altogether. Okay. That may lead to Yeah, splitting up the, the community. So the have we have we seen um, evidence of this happening either now or before? I mean, this is definitely a um, uh, theoretical possibility, but do we do we believe this is happening and it's it should be a concern? Um, like how important, how high priority do you think this is? So I can answer if something like this happened, then to my understanding, yes, I could see something like this happening in the past. Is it still happening? I don't have an answer for that. And in terms of priority, since we are not seeing it anymore, I mean, we should take it up sometime, but maybe not as of a priority at this present. Yeah, I feel like this is more of a, on a case by case basis. I can think of, you know, it, I don't mind, you know, giving this example because I, I think it's public knowledge. The split between Ethereum mainnet and Ethereum Classic, right? That's uh, probably a good example of the community splitting into 
quite quite independent uh, code base because of their their parties and philosophies. Um, sometimes it's it's not necessarily a good thing. Sometimes maybe it is a good thing to allow the different approaches to to become different communities. So I I feel like this should be evaluated on the case by case basis. Yeah. On the uh, mainnet classic split, I think it's a, a bit more nuanced than that, but basically classics become a downstream distribution of mainnet. So that's another way that communities might split. One might stop being you know, the main one and one might become a downstream and just do what they want on top of it because um, even though the code base is split, um, all the code for the most part flows from main network into classic work. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, majority of the enhancement still applies to both code base. Yeah, definitely agree. I mean, I think communities could split for totally benign reasons too that are that are actually yeah. quite good, right? I mean, like, mm -hmm. you know, essentially, right? Sort of in the forked off both Aries and Ursa, right? And I think those were both positive forks, right? It was, hey, here's this component uh you know we're using it but other people want to use it too what are, you know people that don't want to use sort of our main thing why don't we fork it off so it's easier for them to use right i think you know those were you know i i think certainly positive examples of mm -hmm. of projects splitting off right yeah Well, and in some sense, that's what gets at the thing that's hard to measure here, which is a project needs to be friendly enough to new ideas so that those new ideas can incubate within the project, as opposed to having to create their own new space outside of Hyperledger to explore that, that new or interesting idea, right? Because uh, it's, it's, that's the paradox of, of open source is that the easier you are to fork within your project, the less likely someone will have to make a new venue or a new community in order to explore their idea. And what we're trying to get at here is, is there that kind of conflict or shear that makes people want to leave? Or is there that kind of collaboration and friendliness that makes people want to say, I disagree with you, but I want you to watch and see if I'm doing something dangerous and tell me. Yeah, definitely agree there. So I put that under friendliness to new contributors or new ideas. Any other big ideas? Um, I guess we have one more minute and then we should wrap up and uh, give the floor back to Tracy. So um, we probably should talk about the, the cadence of the call. Uh, I guess I'll model the other task forces to have one off-cycle call. Um, probably should uh, self-organize to decide on the, the timing of that uh, through uh, Discord. Cool. So um, I guess, Rai, you would have to create the channel for us, right? Uh, for the task force. That that ability has been delegated to all members with the TSC role. So. Oh, great. Cool. Just awesome. I'll, I'll do that then. Feel free. Will do. Thanks, Rai. Awesome. So I'll, I'll publish this and then. Um, um, I'll, um, I'll coordinate uh, with um, those who are interested to continue the discussion uh, on a off-cycle call uh, schedule, and then we can go from there. Appreciate everybody's input today, and I'll uh, give it back to you, Tracy. All right. Thanks, Jim, and thanks for taking us through this.
Uh, so next week, uh, the things that I know that are going to be on the agenda are, um, they've just all slipped my mind. They were right there and now they're gone. Um, so the pull request from Dano, uh, the review of fabric, and then I think we're back to the beginning of the task forces. So um, we'll be talking about project families next week. So if you have any additional input on the project families that you haven't added to any of the wiki pages or the, the Word document, please do that. Um, and we'll make sure that we can continue that discussion next week. So with that, I'm going to close the call. So thanks for attending today.